Um, Adolf, will you start the um, introduction, please? Yeah, I was uh, told that my introduction should be short and uh, that I, uh, in fact, uh, don't have to introduce Paul because Paul has been a first speaker of uh, the, the swims from the, from the very beginning. And uh, he has a reserved slot uh, in uh, our calendars. And I think it was only the last year where, uh, when uh, Paul was speaking in March instead of uh, February. Uh, I found uh, all, actually it was Oluna who, who found uh, an interesting picture and uh, it is a very good illustration of a Czech proverb. I put it on chat, which is komu není suri dano v apatice nekoupí, which means who doesn't give it from above, he doesn't buy it in the pharmacy. And you see Paul here, that he is really giving it, getting it from above. It doesn't show very well. It's, it's, it's showing up, a very young Paul. Yeah, uh, you have to start very young. Paul uh, has been uh, involved in uh, uh, mycology of uh, the Pacific Northwest. He has been or uh, uh, president of the Pacific Northwest Key Council which is an organization of uh, advanced uh, uh, amateur mycologists and some professional mycologists. Uh, he had been, uh, he, he was the founding member and the president for many years of uh, the Vic Vancouver Mycological Society. And um, he uh, was, uh, closely associated with the origin of, uh, of uh, swims. Uh, from uh, Paul's activities, I uh, really value his uh, uh, collecting effort because uh, it's uh, really uh, a sign how uh, I judge uh, mycologists. And uh, he uh, had, he has uh, over, I don't know, five, 5,000, 6,000 of uh, collections uh, in the UBC herbarium. He has been a Curator on, in there in uh, in the herbarium. I don't know. Uh, I cannot say uh, how much money he got for it. Uh, apparently not not two. Uh, I know that uh, from my own experience with the Royal BC Museum, uh, the curators are not well paid. But uh, he did a very excellent job. And uh, I had a uh, really uh, pleasure to uh, work with him uh, when he uh, was uh, running with uh, uh, Christine Roberts and uh, Oluna and Bryce Kendrick, the Haida Gwai uh, project and um, uh, some projects on uh, Long Beach, etc. So uh, please welcome Paul Kroger as the speaker of tonight. Thank you, Adolf, and uh, welcome, Paul. Paul Hello. is, as mentioned earlier, is one of our 
uh, prior um, Lifetime Achievement Awardees. I hand you over to Paul. Okay, I'll uh, share screen first. Okay, looks just like it did before. Uh, to okay. us, it's different. Okay, great, glad to know that. Okay, Incorporated 1979. This is dealing mostly with the first two decades. Our purposes were to foster and promote the study identification and documentation of fungi in British Columbia, to assist in educating the public in the collection and identification of fungi with emphasis on the safe separation of edible from toxic fungi, to promote and foster greater knowledge and understanding of the role fungi have in forests and other ecologies, and to promote the conservation of fungi and of wilderness areas that serve as vital habitat for a rich and diverse fungal flora. Now that was written in 1979, uh, hence the fungal flora, which we would never use now. Uh, now, if we were to rewrite this, we'd probably have diverse interests such as medicinal fungi, micro restoration, et cetera, incorporated into it. But at that time, it was a bit different. Uh, these are the original board members once we actually incorporated as a society. And I was surprised when I was looking this up to discover I was the first president and Andy was the first vice president. I thought I'd gotten in a bit later than that, but it appears that once we'd actually incorporated with that, um, uh, the original constitution and bylaws, uh, we were the first um, executive people. And these are a few of the other names. Um, many of whom are not very uh, visible now, but Terry Taylor has since moved to the island in retirement. And he lives uh, and still looks at mushrooms. Um, and Greg Thorne uh, just did a year for, of publications for a club. And then he moved on to become a professional mycologist of some renown. Peter Vander Hayden is now the chief scientist of SciGen in Calgary, manufacturing certain compounds from fungi. And um, others um, contributed greatly in the first couple of years of the society. The um, Mushroom Club had its genesis in a group of uh, characters in the Vancouver Natural History Society, like Terry Taylor and Kitsy Fraser, who had an interest in the fungi and mosses and lichens. So they, on their own initiative, had put on mushroom shows at the uh, Vancouver Museum Planetarium Complex. And here is 1974, with rather quaint garb that people are wearing. And I am going to take you back to the 1970s and explain what mushrooms were like in the 1970s. Mushrooms weren't much in the public consciousness then. There's basically edible mushrooms meant money's button mushroom. And at the time, money's uh, grew the button mushroom, uh, much of it for canning. It was the cooperative society, Fraser Valley Mushroom Growers Cooperative. And they had a monopoly on cultivation and marketing of mushrooms in British Columbia. At the time, there weren't exotic mushroom species available in stores except for ethnic uh, shops like uh, Chinatown shops where you could get specialties imported. Otherwise, there was a button mushroom. But BC at the time was the world's largest consumer of the domestic grown button mushroom. Books at the time were very rudimentary. They were mostly black and white illustrated books for North America. Uh, the color editions of books just began to pop up in the mid 70s. So the Provincial Museum Guidebook for BC was one of the only books available for, of local interest. And then the color edition came out in the mid 70s. Wild mushrooms weren't in the public consciousness then, except for immigrant communities. Uh, so a lot of Japanese, Chinese, German, Italian people and their families would go out pretty well uncompeted with in the forests and gather for their own use. And then just in the late 70s, there began to be an interest in the possibility of marketing wild mushrooms overseas. So there began to be a minor export 
to European and Asian countries of our wild mushrooms. Now, the only way that mushrooms were high profile back in the 70s were the magic mushrooms, which were all the rage back then. So this is the uh, sort of atmosphere in which the Vancouver Mycological Society was born. Not much public awareness of mushrooms, except for maybe the magic mushrooms and not many resources for um, information on them. Now, we we're very fortunate that at the time, the Bandoni lab at UBC was very active. So here's uh, 1981, a little foray that we had. And this is Andy McKinnon, of course, and uh, Keith, Keith Seifert, who was another student in the Bandoni lab and some of our early members, Ole Ewell, was actually one of the main instigators of actually formally registering us as a society. And um, Jitsi Fraser, whose husband is here with her two kids, uh, was a, a very important uh, mover and shaker of forming the society also. Uh, the forays then were a lot easier. We'd go out in small groups to local areas and the public just wasn't aware enough of mushrooms to if they noticed what we were doing, they'd be curious or think we we're eccentric, not much more interest. We, there were several uh, individuals who did degrees in the Bandoni lab who were quite instrumental in raising the, the uh, knowledge of BC fungi. So we have Scott Redhead, we have Richard Summerbell in 1981. Scott was at UBC doing his master's in, in 74. Dick was until 81. Andy McKinnon, this is his uh, groundbreaking paper on stem flow and through flow microbiota of a trembling aspen red alder forest. Uh, 1982, Keith Seifert did decay of wood by jellies. Charmin Gamete was there, uh, did her degree in 89. And uh, looking at the the uh, mycorrhizae of apples, domestic apple. Uh, Gavin Kernahan. Uh, was there in, ending in 1993, uh, where he got his uh, master's studying the effect of nitrogen fertilization on ectomycorrhizae of hemlock. And then Eduardo Hovell uh, studied the insect dwelling fungi and the biochemistry of them association with insects. Uh, we had a lot more easy time back then holding small forays. We were a small club. We didn't have that many people. We we're all quite young then, oddly enough, and full of energy. So we had wonderful trips at just Saturna Island, where there was an old fishing resort that we could rent, and no electricity, no, um, uh, yeah, um, it was quite quaint. Um, oh. We, um, in 1983, Andy and I and uh, Heather Sterling and a couple of other people did what was called a Piltskrieg, and we did a mad dash around the province in, I think, an old van of some sort, uh, stopping off at various areas across the southern side, end of the province and around to different sites. And very exciting. We documented a lot of mushrooms for the first time for British Columbia. Um, Oh, never read anything bigger than your head. That's odd. Um, Gary Linkoff, uh, this was 85, 86 was a big year in Vancouver. That's when we hosted the World's Fair Expo 86. Changed the city, but there was lots of activity mushroom wise here. Gary Linkoff came to visit and he was quite instrumental at the time. He published a couple of the new books with color photos that were very exciting, uh, like the Audubon Guide and the Simon Schuster. And he was a founder of the Telluride Mushroom Festival, which is still going. He was president of NAMA, the North American Mycological Association, and very enthusiastic about VMS hosting the 1990 NAMA foray in Whistler. And this we did, and it created a nest egg of money that ever since has allowed the Vancouver Mycological Society to function with um, lots of resources. Uh, he died in 2018, Gary Linkoff. Um, we used to do a lot of displays for the public. This is at the PNE Pacific National Exhibition in 1986. 
a part of their agricultural display section. Uh, we used to do forays uh, through Manning Park area and into Pesaten Valley. Clarence Schmoke, one of the uh, very active members, had a resort, uh, recreation property in Pesaten Valley. And we used to hold weekend forays there, uh, part camping and part staying in rustic lodges. And this is a um, student that was at UBC, never completed his degree, but he was quite active for a while. Um, and these were uh, times when it was a lot easier to get to uh, uh, foray areas. Now, I'd mentioned that there weren't many uh, uh, mushrooms really in public awareness other than the button mushroom when it came to edibles. In the 80s, 1980s, um, several growers of specialty mushrooms and gourmet mushrooms began to um, challenge the monopoly of Money's Mushrooms and Fraser Valley Mushroom Growers Association on the uh, marketing of mushrooms. And eventually there became a thriving gourmet mushroom. And this is Dr. Theodore Takeuchi, who is one of the pioneers in growing shiitake mushrooms locally to provide fresh product to uh, the local markets. And he used alder logs in traditional log farming techniques of shiitake. And um, so we had a delightful um, time. And just at the same time, the first books on cultivation, home cultivation of mushrooms were coming out. So we did a little uh, mushroom cultivation display. I think this was with John Dennis that I did this at the um, uh, Science Museum, if I recall. Uh, we used to have that wonderful old fishing resort on Saturna Island. We used to have spring forays there. And we'd have wild mushrooms and seafood and herbaceous plants to eat. 1990 was when we hosted the Nama Foray in Whistler. Now, I, I, unfortunately, I don't seem to have many photographs available at all of that. We were all so busy putting it on that we didn't photograph it. So um, it was quite an exciting event. It still is spoken of by many of the older Nama members as being an outstanding foray. Uh, we only had one participant die, which was pretty good. And um, we uh, had several species of note that were found there and eventually uh, made it into the literature. These are a few of the prominent mycologists back in, uh, this is 1991. And this is uh, Charmin Gammy, her illustrious Andy McKinnon, Shannon Birch. Lorelei Norvell, who is from Portland, Oregon. Uh, John Dennis, who is at Pacific Forestry Center. Brenda Callum, previously at Pacific Forestry Center. And this dude with the NAMA t-shirt on. Um, uh, Gavin Kernahan was a student who did his uh, study on the effect of fertilization on hemlock mycorrhizae. He went on to do a PhD in Edmonton. Um, and he was um, ever an enthusiastic hunter of mushrooms. Of course, people took no end to uh, pick on me by stuffing a russula in my mouth and lichen around my neck and making me pose in the woods. Um, Drew Simpson was one of our um, very active members who was a wonderful character. He was a Scottish dancer, a uh, Scotch whiskey connoisseur, uh, outdoorsman, gold miner, and a uh, memorable character contributed greatly to the club. Um, and we had many people like that back then uh, who were full of energy and contributed greatly. Here again is the uh, PNE exhibit, this one in 1994, where there is a walk in cooler sort of arrangement in the agricultural building. And we set up this display of of wild plant materials and mushrooms and pictures and posters, etc., in a chilled room and for several days by which the air would get pretty sick in that room. Uh, this is a foray out in Roberts Creek, Mount Elphinstone area, looking out over Port Mellon, I guess it is, the paper mill in Port Mellon there. And this is myself, and I was surprised to note that I'm wearing in this picture the same sweater that I'm wearing tonight. 
I guess I uh, hold on to my clothes a long time. Um, and this is a couple who illustrated something that always amuses me with these forays. We always get initiates that come in and are really enthusiastic about the, picking the mushrooms to eat. And these folks filled up a pillowcase full of the winter chanterelle. And um, we were all sort of chagrined at the sheer volume and lack of selection uh, with the harvesting. And sure enough, uh, somebody who got a ride back said that with them said that by the time um, they were just pulling out of the parking area, they're already arguing about who is going to clean and prepare all the mushrooms that they picked, which we find over and over. This is uh, Victoria Dambois, who is one of our uh, hospitality directors. She used to make cookies and cakes and tea and things for us. This fiddle Fogarty and Victoria's niece. Um, this is Chilliwack Lake, and we used to go there to foray. Uh, and um, this is a memorable picture. This is Tom Tatum, who is quite a character in our club. And we're standing there late in the season. The rain is actually turning into sleet in the background and beginning to turn the road white. The rain was pelting down. We had all these soggy mushrooms. We're standing around eating our lunches with smiles on our faces. And there are several cars that drove by and almost ran off the road staring at us to see what the hell this group of people were up to in the sleet and snail, uh, sleet, sleet and snow. And so that's a sort of, um, behavior that causes public interest in us, I guess. Tom Tatum was a great character, rhododendron expert, and a medical refugee from the US uh, who died in 2001. Um, now, we had always had lots of gathering areas really close to Vancouver. We could take day trips and very short time to get to all sorts of areas near the city of Vancouver. But uh, as the city grew and began to expand and, and logging was fierce through the 80s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, less and less places were accessible. And then there's a big move in the 1990s and into the early um, 2000s to try to bring up the amount of protected area in BC up to 14%. And just happened that many of our cherished areas where we used to like to uh, go to look at mushrooms became provincial parks or other protected areas, and mushroom harvesting was banned in them. It wasn't so much the activities of people like us, uh, just casually interested people or the mushroom enthusiasts that would go through and collect samples to study. It was because of commercial harvest. And a lot of these areas near the city began to be regularly plundered for the edible mushrooms to be sold to the commercial market. And uh, this caused great problems with um, uh, the ability for us to go out and find places to look for mushrooms. Now, here's an early Swims foray, the year after it was formed, I guess. So this would have been, I think, I don't think it was February of 1995, because I don't think we would have done a foray to the Red Creek Fur in Port Renfrew. But here's Hannah Nadell, there's Aluna. Uh, Adolf, um, um, Renata Outerbridge, um, a few other faces there that will be familiar to you. Um, we, uh, in Vancouver, we had other areas. There's great interest, of course, in mushrooms and all the different outlying municipalities and suburbs. So Richmond, uh, we were asked to give a little nature display in Richmond Nature Park, which it turned out to be very popular. So for several years now, we've been returning to Richmond Nature Park to um, do a display. I just realized I got the wrong version of this. I edited it, oh well. Uh, differently. We, this is our annual show at Van Dusen Botanical Gardens, which we, we've had pretty well since the beginning of the club. We've had all of our shows there. It was quite a spacious room, but the numbers of people that we get through are truly quite amazing. Hundreds a day. Sometimes the room will fill up to capacity. And then um, uh, 
uh, it's hard to get around, but there's always so much great interest in the uh, displays. Now, um, with the Richmond Nature Park, we um, uh, started doing an annual display there at the beginning of November. And our club had struck upon an idea to preserve large polypores that are really spectacular examples of their species and to ask the members not to collect any more. So we tried to establish a permanent polypore collection. And so we don't have to have people bringing in old polypores year after year. And so we have this dried polypore collection. And this one with a little square cut out of it is a uh, decorated one from the 1919 Nama foray. There was uh, Maggie Rogers had etched it with a scene and then Paul Stamets had grabbed it and carved out a piece for a cultivation display and put a little Stamets was here graffiti on it. So these things have some historic value, I suppose. Uh, an event that was always extremely popular was our summer barbecue. And the Armelinis hosted it for many years. And they had a wonderful agricultural property surrounded by apartments and townhouses, et cetera. And we used to have these wonderful barbecues there. Here's uh, Porco and Puccini, the um, uh, so a roast suckling pig, and that's a uh, frozen Boletus edulis uh, being held for scale, I guess. By that side, so this is uh, Agostino uh, Armellini, son of um, Fortunato Armellini, who hosted these events. So you can see that the barbecuing, grilling was done on a fairly industrial scale. Uh, As David Tamblin, um, who's very active still, and it was, was active for since pretty well the inception of the club and has held positions for many years. And Tom Tatum, again, a refugee from Portland who uh, was with us for many years. Uh, Fortunato Armellini here. Um, and Joanne Wigglesworth and her husband, Les Wigglesworth, were wonderful active members for years. Here's a sort of barbecue. Uh, and oh my, sausages and polenta and brochettes, oh my. And this was uh, the Armellinis, of course, not surprising. We're an Italian family from Northern Italy. And they have a great tradition of these mass food uh, feeding events. We used to have wonderful times. And something which we instituted for a while was Robigalia. This is the ancient Roman festival of the rust fungus on the grain. And Juliet here and Augustino are uh, joining in on the celebrations here. Robigalia, which is April the 25th, they would traditionally sacrifice a red dog. But instead of that, we, we barbecued sausages and sacrificed hot dogs. And uh, so this is a Robigalia. It was an event we had for a few, few years. And then we used to enjoy going to the Pokong Vegetarian Restaurant, which is a specialty Chinese restaurant. Um, in Vancouver, and there's one in Victoria, in uh, Richmond also. And these are just a couple of the dishes. This is the uh, stuffed um, stinkhorn stems with shiitake and enoki mushrooms in them. Very delicate aroma, very perfumey. They're quite, stinkhorns are actually delightful edibles. And uh, then we have the Tai Chi soup, which is a wonderful yin yang soup with. Um, and, and then we have the hot and sour. So these have a garrotish shiitake wood ear and an okitake, photographed by Scott Redhead, who attended a couple of these. Mount Elphinstone was a place where we used to go on the Sunshine Coast, Roberts Creek. And uh, Mount Elphinstone was home to wonderful mushroom diversity. And there is an uh, old forest there that the Ministry of, Log, uh, Ministry of Forest was very keen to keep cutting at it. It's a community forest. And so the locals in uh, Roberts Creek got very enthused when we found unusual mushrooms there. And there was the, including the Trachloma apium, which led to protests and a big move to save the Mount Elphinstone mushroom. 
And uh, here we've got the uh, Trichloma 8 p.m. This is um, a cartoon. Aha, Trichloma 8 p.m. And that translates into how many board feet? <laughs> and uh, proposed logging and dangerous mushroom parcel. You've changed yourself to a toadstool. Mushrooms are over there. Mm. This is to represent Adrian Belshaw, who was one of the uh, main actors and losers with that too. And so we eventually had in 2000, uh, some 140 hectares designated as Mount Elphinstone Provincial Park uh, to preserve mushroom biodiversity among other values. Uh, another thing that our club did was uh, we were on hand, of course, for the infamous dead death cap invasion, the Amanita phylloides. Uh, we'd watch the death caps being found in Seattle. There was a mass poisoning in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it became of great concern to us that they might be uh, moving north or they might already be in BC. So after a couple of us had seen the situation in Washington and Oregon, we uh, gave information to both the clubs, both uh, VMS and SVIMS, uh, saying that these have been found as far north as Seattle and to keep an eye open and show you know, illustrations, everybody was made aware. And sure enough, in 1997, the first death cap in Canada was found in um, Mission BC under sweet chestnut trees. And so the club and SWIMS also has worked, but VMS especially, to try to document and um, uh, confirm the distribution of the deaf cat mushroom. And uh, we're able through um, mapping out where they are and by uh, looking into the ecological requirements of them to establish an area where they were very likely to be found. So we found that the um, southern and southeastern Vancouver Island, the lower mainland, and South Okanagan appeared to be areas suitable to the growth of the uh, death cat mushrooms are associated with imported non-native trees in a horticultural, agriculture, or, uh, urban horticulture setting. And sure enough, uh, DNA of death cat mushrooms were found in root tips from trees in Kelowna uh, using DNA extraction. So uh, we now do know that our prediction, we, um, yeah, so, so anyway, so uh, the VMS and also SVIMS have been very important in uh, getting it known that these happen, documenting that they're here, where they are, and putting out information for the public or working with public health agencies um, to get um, information out for the public safety. Um, Here's something I'd like to say that an interest in things when a person is a child can be a start of something wonderful if it's nurtured. And I guess I was fortunate to have parents that were very, though not really little nature nerds themselves, they welcomed my interest. So here I am, I was a young child trying to look through a microscope, something that appears to have stuck a bit. And some years later in my uh, youth, I was uh, getting into the mushrooms and now shucks, time goes by and here's what it does to you. Yeah. Um, we had a wonderful commercial artist who uh, did a lot of drawings for our newsletters, uh, Eric Kaiser. And uh, here are a few of his covers that he did for our microfile newsletter back when it was an actual paper newsletter. And uh, these became, our uh, newsletter became one that was highly appreciated throughout North America as being a fun and interesting um, newsletter. I see here uh, meeting September 16, guest speaker, Mar uh, Margaret Dilley. Uh, Margaret Dilley passed away. Um, this December, uh, the December last. And she was a very instrumental pe person in the founding of the Pacific Northwest um, Key Council of the um, 
Puget Sound Mycological Society, the Bellingham Club, and she had very great supporter of the Vancouver Mycological Society and South Vancouver Island Mycological Society. She was a great enthusiastic supporter. Um, so these are delightful covers that um, uh, Eric Kaiser did for our Mycophile newsletter. Uh, this is James Barber, the, uh, what was he called? The Limey Baster, I think he was called. And he was a cook that uh, worked promoting the agaricus. He, he promoted uh, money's mushrooms. And um, so that's another speaker. And here again, we've got more of Eric's wonderful illustrations. Uh, mycology has always been fun. And we actually get the term foray from the uh, words for an announcement for uh, foray in, to foray among the funguses in Hereford, England in 1877. And so they used to have the great fungus meeting at Hereford. And that's where our term foraying for the funguses comes from, to go on a foray. We had a great Canadian mycologist, A.H.R. Uh, Buller, who um, was a very interesting poet. And there's a wonderful biography on him if you look it up. A.H.R. Buller was a wonderful Canadian mycologist. Some mycologists caused rancor. And this is um, Curtis Gates Lloyd. And he was a sort of renegade mycologist who loved to antagonize, antagonize other mycologists. This is his before the study of fungi and after the study of fungi. Notice this picture, he's sitting in a chair, sort of gripping the seat. So that'll come into uh, play in a moment. He created a character, Professor McGinty, who's seen here discovering a new species to poke fun at mycologists who do all their research and publication from pre-existing publications. So people that make name changes, et cetera. And he proposed Curtisioides reticulatum, which are neither a Curtisium nor reticulate on the same principle that Tremelodendron are neither Tremellas nor trees. So he used to love to poke fun and make fun of um, mycologist, the stodgy old mycologist. And here he is a pioneer of Photoshop because here's the same picture of him after the study of mycology. And he, he got rid of the chair that he's sitting on and put in two Samoan ladies. So he was a pioneer of Photoshop in his day. This was 1904, quite the character. Uh, so um, now, Manning, here I'm going to talk briefly about the Manning, and there was a um, Manning report, I believe, that was circulated with the announcement to this talk. So uh, some material that's in here you can actually look at in that Manning report. But I'll just do a quick summary here. Clarence Schmoke was a teacher at John Oliver High School. He taught mathematics, and he was um, getting on to retirement. He uh, the got very active with the Mushroom Club, hosted our forays to Pesaten Valley and our Manning Park um, areas. And uh, he is looking forward to retirement when he was gonna spend his whole time uh, running around the province, looking at mushrooms, doing a Pilts Creek sort of event. And then he was tragically killed in an auto accident in his first week of retirement. Um, but he uh, was a, being a teacher, he, he, he taught mathematics, but his great interest was plants, animals, nature studies in general, and especially fungi. And because he was such a great teacher, he uh, really got people enthused and was a great uh, focus and interest in the club to, uh, he was great for nurturing the uh, keen interest in mushrooms as education. So this is 1987. We had our first Clarence Schmoke Memorial foray just the same year that he died. And uh, these are some of the early members and participants. Jo Tom Tatum, the uh, medical refugee from Portland. John Dennis, who was at the Pacific Forestry Center. Heather Sterling was a real character who was quite active in the early club. 
Uh, Gavin Kernahan, who uh, did the studies on fertilization and hemlock mycorrhizae. Heather Sterling again, Sylvia Bergerson, some of you know. She's a great uh, uh, active person in the club for a long time. And here again is uh, Fortunato Armelini and Gavin Kernahan. And we uh, were running around uh, Manning Park with a permit and gathering specimens, bringing them back, laying them out on the lawn and having just a wonderful time, endless pots of coffee and uh, looking at these specimens. And we began to document a lot of the mushrooms from Manning Park at these weekend long forays where we stayed at the uh, last resort in Manning Park. And uh, so they're just wonderful times. So here's a more recent one. Here's a Luna, of course. 2004, tremendous tricholoma year. as a year where tricholomas were everywhere. And we innovated. We finally got cables to lay our specimens on. And so it's always been a great, interesting thing. So we've been for years going to Manning Park. And because we already had a background there, we proposed to uh, provincial parks that uh, the club and UBC botany department do a, studies of the mushroom diversity uh, of uh, Manning Park. So um, this is just a couple of little captures from a uh, report of the five-year project from 2013 to 2017. And um, we'd um, started with a five-year study that was done with a group of people from within the VMS and um, UBC. And we did regular trips out there as a small group, not a weekend long foray for the whole club. This was sort of a group of, of the uh, particular nerdy uh, VMS members who tried to go out there every few weeks and capture different seasons. We documented hundreds of species. Um, it turned out that in this five year period from 2005 to 2009, we added 425 species to the known species. They're bringing it up to about 640 species uh, from 240 genera and 90 families. So that was what was known for Manning Park uh, up until 2009. And then we uh, proposed five more years, so 10 more, a 10 year study permit, uh, 2013 to 2023. And um, unfortunately, as you can imagine, we've lost some years. Um, so uh, we did a five-year stint. And these are um, uh, one weekend in each year where we had the foray to Manning Park. Generally, we tried to have it roughly the same weekend. Some years, we had to change the date. There were different sites that we tried to visit. And we, uh, they're divided between the different biogeoclimatic zones present in the parks. We had the Angleman spruce, subalpine fir, interior Douglas fir, and coastal western hemlock sites. And then we uh, recorded the different um, finds that were brought back. We tried to vouch for uh, important or interesting ones, as many as we could given our capacity, holding a weekend long foray for the Mushroom Club in general involves a lot of social obligations, a lot of uh, newbies that we are compelled to instruct and guide. And so it's hard to pay a lot of attention to the scientific aspects in such a group setting, but we try our darndest. And uh, out of this work that we've been doing, it turned out now with DNA, uh, studies uh, becoming more and more important. We've had several species described as new that we'd collected in Manning Park and the DNA uh, sequences from material that we gathered, preserved from Manning Park, uh, were used in the descriptions, the formal uh, publication of these species, four quaternarias, not surprising, and polyozelis atrolazulinus when it was found at the um, Polyozelis multiplex, so-called, turned out to be three distinct species in Western North America, two of which we've got in BC so far, and one of which uh, in the publication was from Manning Park. And um, we have various other 
um, things. This is just an excerpt from the report, but it's explaining that we're finding as the results come back from the Burby, Mary Burby's lab at UBC, quite often the names that come out with the DNA comparisons don't match what we tentatively identified them as. Sometimes it turns out that what we've been considering one species is more than one. So there are two distinct genotypes or whatever, to, uh, sort of genetic types of uh, Amanita muscaria, so-called, in uh, Manning Park. And then there are various, uh, it turned out that the kidnums re represent species which have just recently been dignified with Latin names and Hygrophoropsis or Antiaca turned out to be two different things, etc. So there's various very interesting comparisons. And so a lot of the material that the club has collected and documented from these areas have turned out to be very interesting and have contributed to our scientific knowledge. This is sort of a presentation that, uh, of the data that I was, uh, put in the report. So for example, for the five-year period, a checklist of names reported from our foray in the years in which they were found. And then uh, each collection or observation and um, what, what back zone they're in, the bio, Bio, bio geoclimatic zone, ecological classification, the location, the date, and then whether or not it was vouchered. And then there's more information accompanying the herbarium samples that were preserved. So it's, and here you can see it's a beautiful site uh, to uh, spend a weekend in looking at mushrooms. And some of the mushrooms we find are truly spectacular. And so there's, uh, Sometimes we make observations on the abundance or the prevalence of mushrooms. So one year there were tremendous numbers of the catathalesma ventricosum. There were hundreds of them. Some trails had multiple clusters of fruiting bodies like these. Uh, it's usually a pretty uncommon mushroom, but in 2013, they were phenomenally abundant. And there's a spectacular mushroom because of their huge size. At that same year, we had this Claveria delphus that appeared in astounding numbers, literally thousands and thousands carpeting the forest floor. Slimes, what we would have called caprinus, little brown mushrooms, sneak smelling hygrophorus, Lacaria tortillus, which is an unusual species. The hallucinogenic Solosti pelliculosa. The rare, this is a rare mushroom that grows on deer dung, uh, Deconica angustispora. It's a delightful little thing. That's probably not as rare as we think, but if you find a little psilocybe growing on deer dung that has a cap as narrow as it is tall, it's probably going to be this rarely uh, recorded one that grows on deer, elk, moose, and other wild animal dung. And so it'd be neat to keep an eye out for that. The, the old popular hawk wing. Gee. And now I've included a number of Rich Mabley photos here. Uh, Rich did wonderful, beautiful photography and uh, made several of his photos available for our report on Manning five years study. And uh, I thought this would just be nice eye candy to uh, satisfy you want to look at mushroom images as well as people images. And so Herisium, and it's always wonderful. That's another aspect of these forays, the photographers. We have so many talented photographers in the mushroom clubs. And as we saw with the beautifully illustrated BC Provincial Museum guide, these are wonderful uh, results from our club forays is the illustrative educational material that comes out and artistic rendering of beautiful fungi. So uh, Vancouver Mycological Society, mycology is better than yours was a t-shirt slogan from the Bandoni lab 
in the botany department at UBC with all the other ologies running around there. The mycology students used to strut around with the mycology is better than yours t-shirt. And carpe fungum, seize the fungi, collect that mushroom. And here I am in my uh, collectedness. And yeah, so I never eat anything larger than your head. And thank you all. That's the talk. And so many mushrooms, such little time. Thank, thank you, you so much, Paul. That's absolutely terrific. To, to Paul and some of the people in our group, there's been so much dedication uh, on the mycology side of things. Do you see the young people coming up to that level of capability and interest? Um. I think the interest has changed focus a lot. A lot of the um, younger people now are more interested in cultivation, micro restoration, and other aspects of fungi like that. And we don't have that many keen sort of uh, Paris taxonomists coming up. Uh, they're, they're, um, and I think now it's sort of uh, unfortunately, there's a real emphasis on DNA sequencing now. And a lot of the kids, or the young people that I meet, are very much into the uh, sort of lab, squeeze some juice from a mushroom and do labby things with it. And they sometimes aren't trained or interested in looking that closely at the mushroom itself. And so I don't know, they, I, I think there's a bit of a less observational um, skill. The, you know, the background is because I started a few years ago, but people your, yourself and Andy, Adolf, Luna, and on and on it goes. There's such reference books uh, of information, and, and you don't even have to go to the internet. You just ask them a question. They <laughs> seem to know it all, which is you know yeah. a, a good reflection on them. But you know who are we going to after there? They, uh, move on to something not as active. Yeah. Um, Anybody for questions? Uh, Paul? Anything else you want to comment on with regards to the present situation in mushrooms? Um, well, I'd like to uh, remind you folks that you're in a very lucky position where you are southern vancouver island for those of you actually on southern vancouver island i'm impressed with how much nice habitat you have and how your urban areas are interspersed with non-interurban areas and you should be very conscious and pleased uh, to have that situation because here in vancouver we've seen the urban sprawl take out a lot of uh, nice habitat and it's so continuous now that every time I visit Vancouver Island I'm somewhat envious of all the wonderful little parks you have so close to your uh, urban areas. Any questions from the rest Paul, of the audience? I have, I have one Paul. What, what's been happening with VMS during the, the last two years with COVID? Not much at all. Um, we have had virtually no events. Uh, we've had virtual meetings, but um, we haven't had any in-person meetings and no events whatsoever. So we've just been keeping the club going until we will open up um, and for in-person meetings again. Uh, we had a, a great problem. Well, uh, we don't have, uh, I think that perhaps we don't have access to potential sort of uh, events that you apparently do on the island. It's a lot harder for us to find places to gather. Um, and we haven't been too keen on trying to have forays where people carpool and gather. Um, well, so because many of the areas where we would go for such a thing have been swarming with refugees from the urban setting, trying to get out outdoors with the COVID situation. So I'm afraid that we've pretty well been in dormancy, like a sclerotium hiding in the ground. 
thank you everybody and congratulations to the awardees. All the best to you. All the best. Have a great evening. Thanks, David from Thor. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you to all. We'll all see the you. best to you. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Good.